I was stuck in this conundrum of wanting to be known, but feeling very vulnerable about sharing these core pieces of myself. And, you know, we've all been socialized to not want to be seen as needy and to um, present ourselves as high value and as worthy individuals. And for me, that meant that I kept so much of my humanity at bay. This is episode number 549 with Mara Glatzel. Attending to and expressing our needs in relationships. I am so excited to have Mara on the show today to talk about her new book and it's called Needy. And oh man, how many of us do not express our needs? How many of us are terrible at even knowing what our needs are? And lots of things happen when we don't attend to our needs and we don't express our needs with ourselves and with others. So I'm excited to bring her on in just a moment. I want to welcome you back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go on your last first date. And to support you on your journey to lasting love, I wrote two books. The first one is Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And this is a book for anybody who wants to really grow their core confidence and learn to show up, stand up and speak up and play a bigger game and succeed in all areas of life and love. And my second book is called Choice Points in Dating, and it's empowering women to make healthier choices in love. And so both of these books are there to support you on your journey to love, to to having a better life. And you can find them both on Amazon for Kindle or paperback. This week's tip on becoming a woman of value is step number 20, adapt a positive mindset. We often go through life without even realizing how negative our mindset is. And one thing I've learned as a dating coach and as a human is that our mindset is everything and how we see the world is how the world is to us. And so our thoughts reflect our actions and the way we are in the world. So my challenge to you is that if you continue to look at things with a negative lens, to just flip it around and ask yourself, what would it be like if I saw this in a positive way? And before I bring Mara on, I want to invite you to join my fabulous Facebook group. It's called Your Last First Date. And we are a group for women over 40 who are interested in finding lasting love and being supported on their journey. Many, many groups are out there that do not support you. They just want you to have a place to vent. And to me, there is a place for venting, but it doesn't really get you to grow. And so we are extremely focused and guided. I am in the group a lot. I have seven amazing monitors and I am live in the group weekly. So join us if you're not yet a member at your last first date. And now for my awesome guest today, her name is Mara Glatzel. She is an author, an intuitive coach, and a podcast host. She helps humans stop abandoning themselves and start reclaiming their humanity through embracing their needs and honoring their natural energy rhythms. Her superpower is saying what you need to hear when you need to hear it. And she is here to help you believe in yourself as much as she believes in you. Welcome to the show, Mara. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I would love for you to share a little bit of your backstory and how you came to focus on this topic. I was a very type A kind of perfectionist, control freak great a grades in school sort of human and i took that approach in every sphere of my life and that showed up in my career it showed up in my relationships that um real drive towards doing what was kind of capital r right and best and good and with time grew to see how um, much energy I was putting into micromanaging other people's perceptions of me and suppressing my needs, diminishing my desires and turning away from myself towards 
what I believed was expected of me in really every sphere of my life. And this became particularly heartbreaking in my relationships because I wanted to be known and I wanted to be cherished. And so I put a lot of energy into presenting myself in a way that I thought would get me closer to meeting that need for belonging. And the more that I did that, the more alone that I felt. But then I was stuck in this conundrum of wanting to be known, but feeling very vulnerable about sharing these core pieces of myself. And, you know, we've all been socialized to not want to be seen as needy and to um, present ourselves as high value and as worthy individuals. And for me, that meant that I kept so much of my humanity at bay. And that led me to burnout, that led me to um, a lot of relationships in my life ending. And my work grew out of figuring out a way to live differently and relate both to myself and to others in a way that were, was more emotionally honest, even as it's vulnerable or even as it feels risky. I can relate to so much of what you just shared, and I'm sure so many in our audience can as well. It is vulnerable to reveal who you really are, reveal what you really need. And we want to be seen. That's like one of the top needs is to be seen. And if you are going to be seen and heard, then you also have to be willing to be vulnerable. It's sort of this, this little conundrum that we go through. And uh, yeah, if you're public in any way, if you're speaking about a topic, if you're writing a book, it brings out all those vulnerabilities. Can you dive a little deeper into why many of us are uncomfortable with our neediness. One of the primary problems is that we don't have role models for this way of living. And many of us, you know, you spoke to this in, in the intro that many of us don't even know what is what we need or what is possible to need. And so the world is saying, well, just tell me what you need. And I, I don't even know what's on the table. What am I even allowed to ask for? because I haven't seen other women doing this, or I have examples in my mind of other women asking for what they need and being labeled a certain way and carrying that social connotation of, well, you don't wanna be that because if you are, you know, that puts you in the danger category for being abandoned or being rejected. And the stories that we carry about our needs run so deep over the course of our lives. We may have experiences with our families of origin or during our childhood with teachers, with caregivers, where we learned that other people didn't have space for us to need anything, that our needs were a burden, that things just kind of went better when we presented a more perfect and curated version of ourselves. And so when we start to walk this back and allow more of ourselves and more of our needs into our lives, we encounter sometimes these really a lot of grief around times where we were younger and we had needs and those needs weren't met and um, where we didn't feel seen, heard or held. And it can make us much less likely to want to risk that in adulthood, which is why I think conversations like this are so important. You know, this podcast is so fantastic. Um, in communities, uh, the more that we are able to talk about our needs in good company, the more that we have that collective understanding of, oh, this isn't some embarrassing secret about me. Um, I am I am not the only one who has requirements for the relationships that I want to be in. You know, I know for myself, somebody told me at some point, maybe 10 years ago, you know, you're allowed to have requirements for the relationships that you're in. And my mind was blown. I didn't, I had never considered that because I was always approaching relationships from, I should be lucky to be there and I should take what I can get. And it is, it is challenging to take up more space and to practice this because you're not gonna be good at it at first. It's gonna feel you know funky and wobbly, 
But what is on the other side is the ability to truly be seen, to truly be known, and to feel, I don't know, that rightness of fit where you're in relationships and you know that you're valued and um, not, not just because you're good at doing things for them or good at filling that slot in their life or or whatever it might feel like before. So much of what you said is just so brilliant. I I think not having the role models, then making ourselves smaller to fit in with what we think other people need from us, not having the courage to voice our needs because of being labeled. And this can also be cultural. There are definitely cultural labels for people who express needs and feelings. And we're known for what we can do and not what we feel and not what we need. And so it is hard to do as we get older. And it is so crucial if we want to have these aligned, like good fit relationships, because we are in flow with our own selves. And so we can recognize that in others as well. And I I just want to address the word needy, which I bristle at that word. And I'm sure you've had other people say this. I have worked very hard to distinguish the difference between feeling needy and having needs. And I'm curious as to why you chose the word needy. I like the word needy because it is provocative and because it elicits a feeling and in some ways that that bristling shows you that this is that this book is for you and that for me it's the it's the same for me and i carried so many connotations around what it meant to be seen as needy what it meant to be a needy person as a big feeler as a person with a lot of um I'm highly sensitive. Um, I often, I often felt as though I was too needy, whether whether or not I was told that I was too needy explicitly, which of course happened a couple of times. But that feeling of I am simultaneously too much and not enough, that I'm this hungry ghost. And when I went to write this book, I wrote it from the perspective of having needs is an inexplicable part of being in a human body. And it is a fact and not a flaw. And when you think about that neediness, what is neediness apart from a bid for connection, both self-connection and connection with others? And how so often what we see as that, that needy kind of hungry ghost is the result of not embracing our needs because instead of um, taking responsibility for our needs and and honoring them and being in conversation with ourselves, being in relationship with ourselves, we expect other people to know what we need. Sometimes we even say that's what love is. If they love me, they will just know what I need. And I can't tell you how many years I lived in that exact model of, oh, well, If my partner loves me, they'll just know what I need. And if they don't, either I must not need it, the need isn't valid, or I am not worthy of the need, far more insidious. And this feedback loop is happening inside of me without any reality testing. Because I am just assuming this narrative that I was certainly sold, that if I was good enough, if I um, you know, was a patient and loving wife and a wonderful girlfriend that, you know, my partner would just meet my needs because of my goodness. Never realizing that that wasn't their responsibility. It's actually not even possible for somebody to read our minds. And that thing in me which has an overdeveloped sense of being able to read the room or know what other people need before they need it is a trauma response that I work actively to turn down every single day. I had this this feeling of, oh, I'm just, you know, I can expect from others what I give to them, but coming to realize that's not my job either. And it bringing all of these conversations about needs to the explicit level in a relationship benefits everybody. And there's far less of that neediness that we want to avoid. 
um, because we're having real conversations about our needs. I was brought up by uh, <laughs> by mind readers, and um, <laughs> I I think uh, like you, I became highly sensitive to read the room and would always try to anticipate other people's needs because I wanted to keep the peace. And I did that in my marriage as well. And it's really unhealthy. And the neediness, that feeling of my needs are not met, my needs are not met, happens because we don't tune in to what we need and how to express it. And I think what happens when we don't do that is we get really angry, we act out, we have all kinds of protesting and you know, why didn't they know? And I still tell my mother today when she tells me she's mad at somebody and I say, did you ask them? Did you tell them what you needed? <laughs> you know, and it's like, no, still not doing it. Still thinking people would read her mind. And once in a while she will, and she'll report back to me. You know, I asked and they said, yes. <laughs> Amazing how that happens. I am glad that you differentiated the difference between how most of us see neediness and why you chose that word. I think it is definitely provocative. And I think that so many people just need to hear what we're saying today. So let's talk about a big buzzword, which is self-care. People talk about self-care all the time. Like, you know, let's go to the spa and get our nails done and go binge watch TV and eat some ice cream. I mean, those are what comes to mind as what the typical self-care or luxuriate in a bath with some nice suds. What is the difference, do you feel, between the self-care that people tell us we need and the self-care that we actually need? I love this question. I have a love-hate relationship with self-care conceptually because we need it. I mean, we know on some level, I I need care. And yet the self-care that we are so often sold is prescriptive, meaning this listicle of 10 things that's supposed to work for everybody and choose one thing off the list and then it will immediately um, mitigate the ache that you feel and yay, you've done your self-care. And so often my clients will come to me having gotten the list, doing the thing, and they don't feel better. They don't feel, um, they, they're starting to worry that self-care is a waste of their time and their energy and their resources because it doesn't make them feel better. And so when I'm talking about self-care in this book, what I'm really talking about is how we are responding to the question of what do I need? And that true self-care is responsive, not prescriptive. And that means it happens in relationship with ourselves. And it's always the answer to that question of what do I need right now? What's going on inside of me? And what form might that care take today? And maybe it's breakfast, maybe it's, you know, calling my insurance company about that claim. Maybe it's having a hard conversation. Maybe it's going to the spa but it, it's going to look different and it's going to originate from you instead of you picking something off of the menu and fitting yourself into that, that preconceived notion. And I think this self-care that I'm talking about is far less sexy. It's much more ordinary, but there's the kind of self-care that we're sold is prohibitive too because it doesn't fit into our calendars it doesn't we imagine it costs a lot of money or it takes a lot of time or you know it needs a lot of space buffered around it and so we put it off until we have that time money space and we put it off and we put it off and we put it off or we give ourselves we pigeonhole ourselves into these tiny moments of our calendar and say well this is my self care time and then your next self care time will come you know whenever there's another uh pedicure scheduled in your calendar or something and i prefer to think about it as self care is the care of yourself that happens daily in relationship with yourself and that will look different depending on the day depending on the circumstances of your life in that moment depending on the physical needs of your body um, your levels of stress 
all of those factors and more will contribute to your answer to that question, what do I need right now? And so when we are able to turn towards ourselves and get the answer to that question, then we are able to start giving ourselves care that actually restores and um, rejuvenates us. And, but, and also, this is a process. It's a practice. We do it over the course of our lives. It is much too hefty an expectation that one afternoon at a spa is going to reverse all of your chronic stress of the last three years. So that too is a bit of care, you know, how we set up our expectations. And we say, you know, I like to think about it like I'm carrying this really full cup of um, feelings and stress. And, you know, that cup gets full over the course of daily lives. I have young children. Um, it's just the noise <laughs> of my house. Uh, and so I think about those care activities as ways to kind of spill out that cup or turn down, like release the pressure valve, uh, instead of thinking about what is the thing that's going to empty the cup completely, because I may not have time for that. But instead, I have these small moments of how can I give to myself so that my life becomes infinitely more sustainable, infinitely more pleasurable. And how can I give myself those small things over the course of the day so they fit into my schedule instead of being something that is apart from my schedule? I think so few of us tune in like that. You know, what do I need right now? I remember when my sister was going through a divorce and her husband told her that he didn't love her. He was trying to figure out if he wanted to divorce her or not. Or not. They were on a vacation when he dropped this lovely uh, little thing on her. And she was devastated because she didn't see it coming. And I said to her, what do you want? What do you need? And she looked at me like I was nuts. Like it just didn't occur to her to ask herself, what do I need? And when you turn back in inward and really tune in, am I hungry? Am I needing quiet time? Uh, what do I need to, to nourish myself to, to really fill myself back up? Uh, it took me a long time to get there too. And, you know, just that daily practice, I think is just so key. I feel the same way about fun, that people don't have fun in their lives and they think they have to save that up for vacation. And you need to have fun all the time. Like you need to put fun into your life. I think, you know, it's to me, play is part of my life. It is a strong need of mine. I have to be able to laugh every day on some level. And I surround myself with people who make me laugh. And how do you feel about fun? I love fun. <laughs> I was just thinking as you were talking that my partner um, so was like, does it need to be a celebration? You're just going to get the car inspected. I'm like it does need to be a celebration, first of all. And second of all, it fills me up and it's none of your business. Um, but that, you know, <laughs> that my partner's always really astounded at this in me, that everything can be made to be an an excursion, an opportunity, a celebration, and that it is just my preference and also um, my makeup to create those kinds of situations. And I love to be excited about things. At any given time, I have a list of things that I'm just thinking about or lightly researching or, you know, obsessing over while I'm washing the dishes. I like to have a place in my mind that feels really interesting or it's like a puzzle I'm trying to figure out or something new that I'm learning. And that piece of what makes me feel alive, that's the fun quotient for me. It's like, it makes me feel more alive to watch TV shows that make me laugh instead of heavy dramas, which I do trend towards, but I have to, you know, constantly kind of bring myself back and prioritize opportunities that, um, that elicit that joy. And my life is better for it, absolutely. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, 
anywhere on any of your devices. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. Let's talk about people who want to begin this process of advocating for their needs, especially if they're in a relationship and there are a lot of deeply ingrained expectations in their relationships. What are some of the first steps they can take? So depending on whether that relationship is warm for these conversations or not, I might take a different approach. So sometimes we have enough um, comfort and trust in the relationship where we might talk about talking about it. And we might say, you know, hey, I am trying to get more in touch with my needs. And that might mean that things are going to look a little bit different in terms of how I respond. And it's not going to be perfect. I'm practicing. And, you know, I hope that we can kind of do this together, that I'm going to start asking for more of what I need. And I also encourage you to ask for what you need. I hope that we are able to be more emotionally honest with one another in this way. I think it'll be really good for us and a challenge we can take on together. Sometimes um, that's not the case. You might feel a very concerned about whether or not your relationship will survive you getting in touch with your needs whether or not that is grounded in reality or a feeling that you have i want to respect that feeling and to know that you don't have to start doing this work in your primary relationship if you are just starting to get in touch with your needs you can begin by having these conversations with yourself every day what far before you start having a conversation with anybody else asking yourself what you need starting to meet those needs in small doable ways each day just starting to get more data about yourself because when we think about advocating for our needs in our relationships that's a high test situation particularly if you don't know what you need to begin with so the more that you can communicate with yourself. And this is why um, my book Needy primarily focuses on the relationship that you have with yourself to give you the support to have these conversations so that when you go to have a conversation with somebody else, you have a, a working understanding of what you need. That'll help you feel more confident and worthy of your needs being met. And then you might start in places in your life that you feel most comfortable that might be with a sibling or with a with a close friend um, practicing in places to again gain that confidence and that momentum before you have these higher test conversations with your partner i have so many clients who say that the number one place in their life where they're afraid to have these conversations is in their primary relationship which makes total sense because in that relationship, the the risk might feel incredibly high and you don't have to go to that high risk place at first. You can practice getting in touch with your needs and developing that, you know, doing that data collection, developing that relationship with yourself so that when you have those higher test conversations, you're able to approach them with a lot, um, a lot more ease and finally i'll say you know there's there is no way to get good at advocating for your needs in your relationship without doing it and you can be kind to yourself by not expecting that you're going to do it perfectly because you're not it's like setting boundaries usually it's either way too much or way too little as you find your way to a middle ground it's the same with advocating for your needs sometimes we wait way too long and then we're explosive and angry or resentful or you know we kind of whisper it when the person's already left the room so having patience with yourself and knowing that this is a skill like any other and you're practicing it and you will get better at it with time and with practice yeah, I can vouch for that. <laughs> I was terrible at it when I started. And I tell this to my clients too, because you, when you focus first on yourself and tuning into your needs and then practicing with people who are safe, 
it allows the space to be able to take more risks. And I think that we just have to have these conversations or we're not having honest relationships. And a lot of people are scared to really find out the truth, whether this relationship can support who they really are and what they really need. But the only way to find out is to do it. So it's important to practice. And also I love the invitation to be kind to yourself, to be patient because it is a practice. It is a skill. And I've been doing this for 20 some years and it's still hard with some people. It doesn't, oh, it doesn't just go away and become simple. You're more clear, you're more capable, but you still hesitate and it's still scary sometimes. Yeah. So <laughs> let's talk about those needs that people tend to feel are too much, especially if we've been told we're too much, we're too loud, we're too smart, we should dumb ourselves down, we're whatever. Um, what, what do we do with those needs? The first thing that we can do is begin getting in touch with what those messages are and asking ourselves whose voice is that or who benefits from me seeing myself this way. And again, before we make any kind of external changes, it can be useful to acquire some data about ourselves and that context and notice, hey, okay, you know, I, I know for myself that I had these really heavy messages during my upbringing about being chill, like people wanted to be in relationship with people who were chill, who were just, I was always way too much, too many thoughts, too many feelings, too big vocabulary. Um, I am a very high octane person. And the message that I had taken on about that was that I was too much and that other people would leave if I didn't turn myself down. And because these seeds were planted in my adolescence, I didn't have the frontal cortex to be able to, to question those, those um, messages and say, well, you know, am I too much? Or is this a poor fit between us? And so the more that we can have this internal understanding and you know you are your own personal historian the way that you make sense of your life and these messages has so much to do with how you see yourself how worthy you understand yourself to be and how you might be willing to confront some of those um topics when you encounter them you know now and later in life when you're when you're entering into them in relationship and so I think that's the first way is to have a greater sense and understanding of what is happening within you when that is triggered. I'm also curious about where and when this is triggered. So, you know, I was recently teaching a class and I asked uh, my class to do some free writing around the question of where am I the most hesitant to uh, advocate for my needs? And everyone had these great answers that were so specific. And again, the more information that you can know about yourself, the more that you can start to think about, well, what would I like to do differently? If that situation were to arise again in the future, what would I like to do differently in that situation? How might I want to present myself? And knowing that what you need is not a problem. What you need is not too much. It is of you. Those needs are of you. And also expecting that one person in your life is going to be able to meet all of those needs is a problem. That is an unrealistic expectation. And yet so many of us carry that belief system about our primary relationships. And we think, you know, there's something wrong if this person can't be everything for me. And what does that mean about me? And so the more understanding that we can have about our relationships 
and our multiple relationships and where different aspects of us are being fed or these places where maybe, you know, I have a desire to be in community theater. That's unexplored for me. Um, I have a whole kind of understanding of a need that that might meet, but I haven't yet met that. But that that is a yearning in me that has nothing to do with my partner. And so beginning to know yourself and also really wrapping your head around the idea that expecting that one person to do everything for you can help you to start meeting your needs in different ways. Maybe there are some needs that I meet in my relationship with myself. There are some needs needs that I meet with my sisters, with my best friends. Um, some needs that I meet with a therapist or a mental health care professional who, you know, I can talk about all of my anxieties or all of the things that I feel um, without restriction. Having multiple places where you're getting your needs met and knowing that that's okay, that that doesn't mean that you have too many needs um, is really ideal. I think the more that we can um, expand our network, the more uh, satisfying our lives can be and enriched and the less pressure that we put on that one primary relationship. It takes a village. (laughs) I I think that we forget that is certainly the message in media that we should find the one and that person is our everything and they complete us and it's so much to unpack and undo. But I wanted to bring up, because something came up for me as you were talking, that there are people who then start to meet their own needs and they have their friends and they have all these people and they have themselves primarily because they don't trust anybody else to meet their needs. So what about people who are in that space where they think, I can't really trust anyone, so I'm just going to meet all my own needs. This is again so common. I think that if we have um, painful stories around our needs during our upbringing, we go in one of two directions. One is very needy in the way that we have no needy to be. And one is very much buttoned up, nothing to see here. Needs, I don't know them. Um, And so when that happens, it can be really challenging because you are inevitably opening yourself up to disappointment. And that disappointment, somebody else not being able to meet your needs or not being able to meet your needs in the moment is not a referendum on you or your needs. But again, that poorness of fit. When we ask for what we need from somebody else, It is their job to determine whether or not they have the capacity to meet our needs in that moment. And then it is our job to tolerate their response. And so when our needs feel so tender, you know, if you're in this position, it might take so much in you to work yourself up for asking for the tiniest corner of something. And then if somebody else says no, oh, I want to slam the door shut and I want to say, see, I knew it. I shouldn't have asked. I never get my needs met. This is exactly what happened last time. And so finding places to give voice to that internal process can be such a game changer. And to to hold on to that yearning inside of you. You know, I say this to so many of my clients who are in my courses, they are working with me. They want their needs met, otherwise they wouldn't be there. But it's so, it feels so triggering, it feels so challenging. And I'll say to them, you are here. You walked in the door. You knew exactly what I was about and exactly what I was gonna ask you. you and you came to me for help, which lets me know that you want your needs met even if it feels insurmountable right now. And so honoring that desire in you to feel more connected, to feel less alone, and getting as much support for that as you can so that you are able to begin to, in small ways, have these tiny experiments of asking, again, the closest, maybe safest people to you, um, or sometimes it feels safer to experiment with total strangers, whatever feels safe for you, but to have these small experiments and to let yourself receive, which can be the hardest part. Sometimes you can work yourself up to the ask, but the receiving feels 
overwhelmingly vulnerable. And that too takes practice. I talk about it in my own mind with myself as sitting on my hands. It is not easy for me to receive. And I know that I need it. So when, when I ask and then, you know, the person says yes, and then I want to take it back and it feels just mortifying to have them do something for me. I tell myself that I'm sitting on my hands, kind of just putting my hands underneath myself on the seat. And just don't move. Just take it in. And every time it gets a little bit easier. Yeah, it's really important to not just shut down with the first no also. Like I think... A lot of times I I remember asking for things. Part of it was I didn't know how to ask in a way that was connected, that checked in with the person, that, you know, really a lot of the things that I know today, but also asking people who were not willing or able to give and how hurtful it felt in the moment and shut me down. And today I would approach it very differently. You know, I would, I would definitely prepare for the conversation differently. And when I would get a no, I would also get curious about the no, you know, instead of just shutting myself down. And sometimes it's not in the moment. Sometimes it's much later, but I remember really struggling with all of those. I want to, I want to speak up and get my needs met. And then I have these people who put me down or say no. And, And it sets that scene for you to not want to ask for what you want again. So speaking of setting the scene, how can people create a blueprint for what they need in their relationships? The more that you are able to know about yourself, the more that you are able to know exactly what to ask for from other people. Because I think the last thing that I would add to what you just said is that making sure that you are actually asking for what you need, because a lot of times you might think I was really clear and you were dancing around it or inferring or expecting them to read between the lines to get around saying, I feel this way and I need this thing from you. And so in Needy, I walk you through these nine universal needs that we all have from safety, such a core need, um, through rest and sustenance and trust and integrity, sovereignty, love, belonging, and celebration. And the more that we're able to be in relationship with ourselves, the more that we're able to know, hey, I have a need for rest or I have a need for safety, belonging, and the way, the particular flavor that I express that need or I want that need met is specific unto me. So for example, I, as probably many of you, because it's very annoying, um, really bristle when somebody is on a device when I am speaking to them. That makes me feel immediately unseen. They're not paying attention. I That is a place for me where I then go to tell myself all kinds of stories about what's going on in this relationship. And so it's really important for me from that belonging need to express to my partner and other people in my life, I need you to be far more attentive to how you're using your devices around me, particularly when we're in conversation, then, you know, I don't know how you, what other people want or expect from you. That's not my business. But when you're talking to me, can you please either put the phone down or say, I'm in the middle of something really important. Can you hold one second? I want to hear what you have to say and I'll be right with you. So that's an example of a belonging need where the overarching need is belong. I need to belong. I want need to know that I am seen and witnessed and known in this relationship and how it is expressed. That need is expressing itself is through this particular circumstance. But this comes from many times of knowing that I am experiencing <laughs> deep anger or resentment right? Your anger, your resentment, all of these are neon signs pointing you towards something that you need. 
And so when you have these experiences in your relationships where you find yourself feeling really resentful or really angry, really frustrated, asking yourself, you know, what, what did I need that I didn't get? Because that will help you to start creating this blueprint of, okay, you know, I, Mara Glatzel, am a person who needs these certain kinds of things in relationship because of my upbringing, because of uh, my personal self-talk, because of all of the things that are going on inside of me, if I'm going to be in a safe and loving relationship with you, these are the things about me that I personally require. And no two of us are gonna have exactly that same recipe. And that comes through that practice of noticing, well, you know, what shuts me down? What makes me wanna, you know, pack up and kind of, turn away? What makes me angry? What makes me feel resentful? And starting to walk those back so that next time you can advocate for yourself ahead of time and say, you know, I feel really connected to you when you um, communicate with me in this certain kind of way, or you when you use words of affirmation, or um, when after we have a fight, we have this moment of repair where we reconnect and it doesn't just kind of slip into the abyss. All of those things are these particular ways of wanting to be seen, wanting to be known. And um, the more that you are able to be with yourself in the process, instead of hyper-focusing on what the other person needs, the more you're able to focus on what you need, the better equipped you will be to, to advocate for those needs in the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking about so many different times when people did the device thing or I, that's a big trigger for me too. And I, I remember when I started setting boundaries and really speaking up many years ago, I noticed that when I would speak to my mom, she would put me on hold and put me on hold for a long time. And I would just get so angry. And I said to her, when I'm speaking to you, I want to be able to focus on our conversation. And when you put me on hold, it's very disconnecting. So if this happens again, I'm going to hang up, you know, and you can call me back when you're ready to focus. In the beginning, she was really not happy about it. And then she started to get it that I wanted to connect with her. It's part of her makeup that she has ADD. I am positive. She was never diagnosed, but she needs to attend to everyone and everything all the time, which makes her feel very disconnected when you're with her. And so I know it's not personal, but I enjoy focused conversation. And so I have hung up. I don't have to do it anymore. You know, she's like, I'm going to let that go to voicemail. And I'm like, I really appreciate that. So anytime that we can really tune in, what, where am I getting resentful, angry? Because anger really holds a lot of clues for our values and our needs. So finally, Mara, I would love to hear the answer to the question I ask everyone. What are your final words of advice for anyone who wants to go on their last first date? Show them exactly who you are. It can feel so scary on a first date to show people who you are. And this doesn't mean, you know, unloading all of your stuff on the table <laughs> between you, <laughs> but it does mean paying close attention to places where you might fold or compromise or um, acquiesce to somebody else in a way that you do not want to do for the rest of your life. And the more that you can risk being seen and being known, um, the more that you are opening yourself up to a potential for love that will grow with you and enable, allow you to be exactly who you are. And it, the stakes can feel high, but if you have to be somebody that you aren't in order for a relationship to work, it's already broken and better to know that sooner rather than later. Absolutely. Very, very sage advice. <laughs> Easier said than done, but yep. really paying attention, I think, like you said, pay attention to the parts where you want to make yourself smaller, where you want to not speak up because you're afraid of rocking the boat. Those things come up 
even on the first phone call. I mean, I have seen them in a texting conversation, just letting someone know that that doesn't work for you. You know, it's if somebody can't handle that, then they're not the right fit. So we really have to really do this work. It's such crucial work. Uh, I love this conversation, Mara, and I would love for you to share a link where people can find you and find your book. Yeah, come hang out with me. Uh, you can find me at maraglatzel.com forward slash book, where you can learn about me and you can find Needy and hear more about the work that I do with people. Great. And I know you have a quiz, a free I quiz do. on your website. Yeah. And you have Facebook and Instagram and all of that will be in the show notes. So thank you so much, Mara, for coming on the show and for sharing this really beautiful conversation with my audience. Oh, thanks for having me. This has been wonderful. Thanks everybody for listening today. If you love our show, please take a moment to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Every rating and review is so important to the continued success of the show. And as always, here's to your last first date. If you are ready to get unstuck, gain new tools, become more empowered, and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half-hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application.